God bless you, brothers and sisters, and welcome to Godspeed Magazine Live. As all of you are reading the Israel issue and thinking about all the ways that God is bringing his holy land up and fulfilling biblical prophecy, there's that question that is, what is God, where is God in relationship to things like Islamic terrorism, in relationship to civilization, jihad or Sharia supremacism, all these things. And we all have friends and neighbors and coworkers who are Muslims. How is God, where is God, what is God doing right there? And on this particular episode of Godspeed Magazine Live, you're going to find an incredible testimony of how Jesus is directly involved. After Rezgu, he ran out of targets on the beach. He entered the hotel grounds to hunt for more victims. At the pool, more automatic gunfire. This latest blast followed a string of suicide bombings targeting Christians celebrating Easter. But in his wake, bodies of victims lie everywhere. The beach, on the stairs, by the pool. The choir was singing when the bomb went off the sounds of chaos and screaming could still be heard. Welcome back, brothers and sisters. After watching that montage, I imagine you're asking yourself, where is God in all of this? When we come back from this quick commercial break, we will be here at the Church of Yeshua HaMashiach in Lemon Grove, California, to interview a man who personally encountered Jesus Christ in his hospital room, and you won't believe what happened. I'm Haysam Bezmar. I'm the author from this, the book, From Deception to the Truth, From Allah to God. You can get it on Amazon.com worldwide. It's a good tool if you ever want to improve your knowledge on the subject of Islam, whether it's for personal growth, or for to be able to benefit those around you with the right knowledge of how to minister to Muslim and bring them into Christ correctly. May God bless you and thank you for being here. God bless you brothers and sisters and welcome back. We are now honored to be joined by Reverend Haitham Besmar, who is not only an ordained minister, but also a bishop of the Church of God in Cleveland, Tennessee. Haitham, thank you for joining us. It's an honor to be here. We are truly, your story is exceptional, unparalleled in my mind. I have yet to have anyone like you or it even reminds me of you remotely. So I love, you're going to enjoy this. Stay very, very focused. To get this into context, let's start with 20 years as an economist all around the world. So they have a context of where you sort of came from professionally. Tell us about I'll your career. I'll take you back to where I was born. Okay. I was born in Damascus and... Uh, to a devoted Muslim family. And normally when you're in a devoted family, they teach you Islam from day one, basically. The minute you start speaking, everything is embedded and is fed into your brain and programmed. Allah is everything. Mm. It's even embedded in the Arabic language. So for the first few years of my life, I would imitate whenever and try and act. If my dad was praying, I would step behind him and imitate every move he makes. Wow because you want it to be so much like your dad. You want it to be so much like a, a father figure in your life. And when I was a teenager, I memorized the entire Quran by heart. That is such a But feat. that didn't help me at all because I've been always outspoken in my life. So it didn't help me to say the least because then when I asked a question, I got punished severely for it because now you're challenging the authority of Allah wow. in the Quran. And what does that kind of punishment look like? Um, heavy-handed, everything that, we, that a parent shouldn't do, they did, because in their opinion, they're preventing you from falling into hellfire, which Allah promises severe punishment to those who question Him in the Quran, in many sections of the Quran. So when I was at the age of 17, I left Damascus and went to England and studied civil engineering and higher education in finance and economy, and I started working, but I concealed my identity as a Muslim. Mm. because it was so embarrassing for me, everything that's going on in the Muslim world, I didn't want to be associated as one of them. Wow. And then I would see when the Arabs flogs into England in the summertime, and the, the shameful act and the heinous acts they do, whether it's lust, perversion, everything you, you, you don't want to see a Muslim do or a human being do, they were doing it. Mm. Getting drunk, getting uh, being a womanizer, being in clubs all the time, 
and spending money like rice for nothing. Uh, not that there is something wrong with it, but at least do it for the human benefit rather than for lust and perversion. Absolutely. So I wanted to disassociate myself totally. And when somebody asked me, are you from, where are you from? I'm from England. I would dismiss entirely the whole idea of anything associated with an Arab world or being Muslim or any of that, because I was so deeply embarrassed by it. And wow. I didn't want to be associated with anything of the same. Amazing. Then I started working for an international organization. I traveled the world. Uh, a lot of them were Muslim world and the contradiction became even higher. So the need for me to conceal my identity as a Muslim became even stronger because I didn't want to be associated and be equal to these hypocrites. And if you look in the Bible, Jesus got really angry in the cases when he met the hypocrites and the Pharisees. Absolutely. That's when he truly got angry. He had patience with those who are lacking the knowledge, who have no idea what's going on, but he was always angry and truly he's, he, he had the anger of God manifesting through him when there was hypocrisy and contradiction. So, so that raised up anger in me and I disassociated myself from the whole concept of Islam totally and I became a closet Muslim. Mm. I prayed five times a day. I fasted Ramadan. I did the, 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 the beads like the Roman Catholic, the worry beads. Muslim carried them around. Mm. I did maybe 2000 vain repetition prayer every night because of the fear. If I don't do them, Allah will punish me and punish all my family. So there was nothing out of content, out of love and relationship with Allah. It was always out of fear. Until I was told by two hospitals, I wasn't going to live until the morning. This, this piece is the piece that absolutely amazes me. I've heard so many testimonies. I have the luxury of getting to hear testimonies from people, of getting to ask about testimonies. But people that have had either an auditory physical encounter with Jesus hearing the voice of God or voice of Jesus. Uh, so please. Well, I guess God knows us more than anybody. And Jesus knows us. When he said, I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb, it is correct. Because he knew my wife, who when we got married, she was born again Christian. And she would sometime discuss with me. In fact, the first thing she said to me, your religion freaks me out because I thought, well, things are developing towards marriage in here now. And you need to know I'm not a Christian. I'm a Muslim. I can talk to talk, but I'm a Muslim. And it's concealed in me. And she said, well, your religion freaks me out. I said, don't worry about it. Mine it freaks me out as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's the known fact. And once in a while, every now, she never challenged me. Bless her heart. She was always good and peaceful about the whole thing. And she would bring out something in the Bible. And the first thing out of my mouth will be, which is what a Muslim would say. Yeah, don't worry about it. The Bible is corrupt because the Bible is being translated. But then when I research into the Quran, the Quran is corrupt. According to Islamic references that are 100% authenticated and approved and acknowledged by all Islamic authorities around the world. Sahih Bukhari says that they were supposed to be 116 chapters and another reference Sahih Muslim would say in volume 3 would say there are supposed to be 111 chapters wow. but we have 114 chapters wow. so if you think about it they either took away two chapters or added three chapters but the in chapter 6 in the Quran says no one will add or take away from what Allah says well they have plus it's only in Arabic so if you're from Indonesia, Malaysia, India, Pakistan, or anywhere around the world that does not speak Arabic, and that is 73% of 1.6 billion people around the world, they have to rely on whatever translation into their wow. native language. So they cannot dismiss it and say the Bible is corrupt because it's translated. The Quran is corrupt because it's translated as well. Yet when you're asking somebody to pray, they have to pray in Arabic. They have to recite the Quran in Arabic. So they're reciting like parrots. Now that's dangerous because you're reciting in prayer what is not from your heart. You're just saying it. Mimicking it. Yeah, I can make 10 parrots Muslim, but does it make them a Muslim or Christian or whatever? Right. You have to have the heart. Absolutely. It's all from the heart and there is no heart in it. So when I was told 
Within three days and five years ago, I lost vision in my left eye for the shingle virus and the optic nerve. The hospital told me, the first hospital said the virus traveled backward into the brain and it's eating the brain. Ugh. So I, I told the doctor, don't worry about it, you do your job and I'll do mine. And she said, well, I know what my job is. And she was laughing at me like, uh, what are you going to do? I said, I'm praying. Oh, okay. Yeah, but your organs are shutting down. So what are you oh, going to do? Yes. I said, I'm going to pray. So she went away and 40 minutes later she came back. She said, we decided to send you to a different hospital. They're dealing with your eye anyway. They're a more equipped trauma one division hospital. And we're going to send you there. So I said, that's fine. They sent me there by ambulance. So when I got in, I told them I need you to do all the tests from the beginning. Forget this two inches dossier that the first hospital sent with me and do your own test. So they did. Within an hour, it was just after midnight, the doctor came to me and he had the dullest and the most sad look in his eyes. And he said, you know, my friend, I'm afraid all the statistics are against you. If you survive until the morning, we're going to have to induce a coma to slow the virus because I'm worried it's going to go into your right eye. And it's already going to make So if you experience slowness of speech or inability to make thoughts, correctly or speak, it's normal. It's part of the progress because we have no idea which area of the brain has been attacked until I get the team in the morning to do the CAT scan, the MRI, everything else. So I said, okay, I'm hooked up to more wires than you need to run the entire city. So you don't need to bother me anymore. And he, said, he looked at me, he said, no. He said, then go bother somebody else and leave me be. And let them know at the nursing station if they need something, unless urgently they see a flat line, they don't need to come in here. He said, okay. So he left. I turned on my right side and I started praying for Allah to take me. Because I didn't want to be a vegetable. I didn't want to be dependent on anybody. And I didn't want to be a burden for my young family. So you prayed for death? I prayed. I was done. I thought I've done. I've been in control all my life. More than anybody can imagine. I've achieved more projects and more achievement in my life than 10 people put together. And I thought, I'm done. I've reached, I've, I've done the race, in my opinion. So I was praying for Allah to take me, and that's when I felt a, a hand touching my heart with a voice telling me, you're not done here yet, I've got so much work for you to do. I thought, I'm dead, I'm in heaven, they put me to work immediately. There's no, but I just got here, give me a chance, let me rest. And I opened my eye and there was a, a bright light coming in. I couldn't figure out what it is, but I could see the image of what we know of Jesus Christ, Yeshua. And I said, who are you? He said, I'm Yeshua. I said, which Yeshua? <laughs> he said, the only one, Yeshua HaMashiach of Nazareth, that is born, died on the cross for you, raised from dead, and is now in heaven. Hey, where is Muhammad in all of this? And he said, Muhammad is dead. <laughs> okay, I know Come he's on. dead. He said, I am that I am. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I have known you and loved you before you were even formed. I said, but hold on a second, sir. You've got the zip code wrong. I've been a Muslim for 50 years. He said, I know. But I've had my eyes on you all your life. But the Quran 4, chapter 157 says you are not killed, you are not crucified, it was made to believe. What kind of an aloof God will give you deity and take it away 600 years later? He said, no God would take me, take my deity away. Explain to me his deity, why he had to die on the cross for you and me. Why he had to be the final and only sacrifice that makes the difference for my sin and your sin. Otherwise, we're just one sin in roller coaster, one after another. So I declared him my Lord and Savior. We spent, it was daylight before he left, so I have no idea. It felt like eternity. He answered every question I had. And by daylight, I left the bed and I was sitting on the chair, still wired up to all the wires and everything, like a, a major disaster case of cables went wrong, <laughs> wrapped around everywhere. <laughs> And the doctor came in, and it's a teaching hospital. They had all the other student doctors came in, and they were like wallpaper around the wall. And they were all looking at me like, 
there is something wrong here. And I said, I'm hungry. <laughs> and the nephrologist said to me, hungry? I said, yeah, let's, if you want me to eat your mattress, I can start, but otherwise you have to feed me. Because <laughs> I did not eat for two days. I need to eat. Two days later, I left that hospital on my own feet. I declared him as my Lord and Savior to him, and I left on my own two feet two, year, two days later. Amazing. Walked out of that hospital. In fact, they brought me the wheelchair, and they said, you know, Mr. Besmar, we'd like you to sit down, and the nurse will take you out. I said, I'm not going anywhere near it. If you want to sit in here, I'll take you all the way to my car, and then you drive it back. <laughs> and she I'm said, well, let me call a doctor because it's liability issue. I said, I'm not going anywhere near it. So the doctor came thinking there is authority here. And he said, you have to because of liability. I said, I'm not going anywhere near it. I am walking outside of here. You want to sit in it or walk with me? You can. He said, I'll walk with you. So I asked him along the way, I said, has there anything that you've missed maybe in all of this? Because I did not take medicine. I refused morphine all the way because I've never been on drugs. I wasn't going to die on drugs. Amen. And he said, we must have missed something. And I said, yeah, you've missed a big miracle here. You're looking at one. I was supposed to be dead, according to you. I'm out walking on my own feet, discharged. All my organs are working. And he, he didn't know what to say. I'll bet he but then when I left, there was a point where I had to come out and say, honey, by the way, I'm Christian now, because I couldn't tell my wife. How long did it take you to finally tell her? Uh, about two weeks. Uh, it was a fun factor because I was researching and I just had the surgery in my eye and I was paint f facing down on a, on a bed with a hole in it, the massage bed, because I have to be a certain way for the gravity, for the uh, whatever they put in, the silicone and everything else. And I would have one book after the other and my wife would tell me, I could read it for you. No, honey, I need to read this for myself. Then when I told her, she said, wow, hallelujah, I've been praying for this for seven years. Unbeknown to me, the power of prayer. Completion in seven Not years. just her, everybody in her circle of church, uh, friends, and everybody was <laughs> praying for my salvation, and I didn't know. Bishop Desmar. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I started studying the Bible. I had two, two pastors, uh, Andy Garber, in Ohio and Kevin Starr, also another pastor of the Assembly of God, both of them, and they were my mentor. So I would have two hour Bible study today with this one and in the afternoon with the other one, the following morning with this. They wow. gave me all the time in the world to be able to. And then when I leave them, I have a question. I call them back. I have a question of faith. Sure, brother, what is it you need? So I asked them, challenged them. They challenged me back and I started studying the Bible. And I thought, I've memorized the Quran for the wrong Allah, for the wrong God, basically. I owe it to him to memorize the Bible for the right God. Wow. And that's what my I'm working on now, to memorize the entire Bible by heart. Praise God. Because there comes a day where I'm told it's going to be taken away from us. Hmm. And I thought, if it's in my heart, they cannot take it unless they take my heart away. Come on, you'll be the walking Bible for whoever's near you. That's what it is. Praise that's what God. it is. So I'm almost there, about a year or so away from completing my task, but I'm there. And I thought, you wanted me to do the job for you. So I joined the Church of God. I uh, obtained my first credentialing as a first level minister, uh, exhorter, and then you have to do certain teaching and all of this. And I was accelerated to become a fully credentialed minister. And I thought, what is the highest you can get here? And I was told it's a bishop. I said, let's try for that. So I did, and last uh, March, I did my examination and passed, and I was ordained in the camp meeting in June, last June. Hallelujah. So just a couple of months ago. What an arc. And if you don't mind me asking, how old are you now? 55. So five years. It's been five years of a well, whole new world. Uh, it's. I always tell people, I'm five years old with 50, 50 years experience. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> that is so good. Because it's not what you have done. It's just the experience. God has prepared you, equipped you. Whether you're saved or not, it doesn't matter. He still has his hand on your life. And I've had many Amen. attempts on my life, seven or eight attempts on my life. Seven or eight attempts on your life. Yeah, but he, he gave it. He, he's the only one who can 
take it away. So Amen. we're not worried about it. We worry so much about when I'm going to die, how I'm going to die, all of this. It's all in his hand. It's all ordained. So why do I need to worry? We worry so much about when the next penny is coming from. It's all in his hand anyway. So Only I don't have to worry. Worrying can add an hour to his life, right? Well, worry is really a form of atheism. Because what you're trying to do is trying to plan your future without God in the picture. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's good. I love it. Because then you're saying, what can I do as a man? Well, the reality is you can't do anything as a man. It's but through him, I can do all things, all things. through Christ who strengthened me. But instead, when you start worrying, you have to hold every thought captive to the Lord immediately. Because that is your first step where hell and darkness want you to be, to start doubting. Worry is doubt. Anxiety is doubt. Doubt is lack of faith. Come on. So therefore, it's a form of atheism. It's a form of rebellion because you're becoming rebellion against everything God gave you. And you're rebellious against God himself with the word in the Bible that tells you, I can do all things through Christ, Christ who strengthened me. Absolutely. So if you have healing, he's Jehovah Rapha, he's the healer. If you have a financial need, he's Jehovah Jireh, he's the provider, he is everything. So why worry? Just give it to him. Absolutely. But Thanks. we have to have the faith to submit and say, I'm a living sacrifice, God. That's not my life. It's yours. Take it however you want it to be. Your will is what I need, not my will. Amen. And oh, that's what I've been trying so to, huge. to carry on. So good. I, there's a couple of things that, and both these are for you guys. There's a couple of things that I'm hoping we can give to the audience to sort of take away because God asks us to always be uh, focused on him moving. And so we want to always give our audience the opportunity to be God moving, to be in Christ with their feet moving and their hearts focused and heads focused on him. And so the two thoughts I have that I think would be incredibly valuable for the audience would be one, how would you tell the audience to separate in their minds? Don't connect. Um, if you have Muslim brothers, sisters, friends, neighbors, whoever that are around you, these are the ways where these people minister and get closer. And on this side, if you start seeing these particular signs, this might be more like do not go near this area because I think America needs that sort of ability to discern the well, difference between Islamic terrorists, for example, versus Muslim neighbor. Yes. Well, what there is, there is no Islam. The terrorism of Islam is no longer an issue. The, the, for somebody to come in and shout Allahu Akbar and detonate themselves is not so much of a fear anymore. Right, that's not the primary form right now. The form right now, which is, has always been the agenda of Islam, because when violence doesn't work, you have to penetrate under, under uh, cover. Undercover. And that's what they have been doing is the cultural and political jihad. Hence, we have four uh, Muslims in Congress now. And they're doing enough damage without fuel. Mm. So can you imagine if you give them more fuel to it? Uh, before you go and worry about your Muslim neighbor and friend or, or colleagues, co-worker or family member who suddenly flipped and turned to Islam, we have a lot of them these days. Let's worry about you, where you stand with God. Amen. Because it's so easy to point at others and forget you. Oh, so true. I want to be able to focus inside, outside into me first. Make sure I'm aligned with the word of God. I'm doing what God wants me to do before I could start going back going outside and judging others. And who am I to judge? Exactly. It's above my pay grade anyway. Absolutely. So I cannot judge. True. But we could be fruit inspectors where you could say, well, your fruit says other contrary to what your belief or what I hear from you. Because we have a lot of churchgoers that say something, behave differently. They're heathen all week and angels on Sunday and right. Wednesday. Absolutely. And they think two hours a day. The key factor here is to isolate all the noises. If you're in your car and you're trying to listen to music, do you put a hole in your mufflers and open the windows and leave a door <laughs> open and say, my music is so crisp? That's no. the same way trying to listen to the voice of God. You have to isolate all the outside voices. When you go to a Muslim friend or an atheist or whatever religion that calls for other than the deity of Christ is an occult. So you're dealing with Islam, you're dealing with Jehovah's Witness, Roman Catholic, you're dealing with any denomination that does not call for the deity of Christ, the Son of God, the living God, the one who is, was, and will always be, and is coming back, and it's an occult. 
Hallelujah. So therefore, when you're dealing with those, you need the Holy Spirit. We don't lead anybody to Christ. Amen. Only those whom the Holy Spirit lead them to can be led. And there are those That's who sow, so those who water, those exactly. who cultivate. So you cannot be all of them at the same time. God will accelerate time at the end where you would he would accelerate according to Amos 9.13, I believe. He would say the reapers will become the, the, the sower will become the reaper and they will overtread their grapes. And so God will accelerate time and sometime he will accelerate and God knows how much he accelerated me in the ministry. Because in five years I've accelerated more than 25 years equivalent to somebody else. But it's for His glory. It's not about our name. It's about His name, Amen. not our fame. His name. So true. So what you do when you meet a Christ, when you meet a Muslim brother or sister or a friend, co-worker, whatever it is, ask them questions that mean most to you. Inquiry of faith, but be equipped. And if you have somebody who is going to justify, they're not ready to listen yet. Mm. If you ask them a question and they justify their 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 answer and they go around in circles, they're not equipped. They're not ready yet. I was 50 years in Islam with a stupor spirit covering with the blinder over my eyes. I couldn't see the reality and the truth if you hit me with it. Mm -hmm. And those who want to justify and explain and justify and explain, I always tell people when I meet a scholar in Islam, it takes two and a half to three hours to lead them to Christ. The wow. more knowledge they have, the better it is for me because you can puncture those knowledge. Mm -hmm. You could show them the contradiction. When you meet an idiot and you want to lead them to Christ, it takes you years. <laughs> and, and that's no exaggeration. I just want to say for the camera, in full disclosure, God calls us to be transparent and authentic. You're looking at a 35-year idiot. 35 years it took me to be punctured and finally accept that Jesus was God, I had no idea, and he had to almost practically, literally slap me in the face to spin me around and make me go straight. So I'm living proof of that theory well, right there. That, that's what it is. You justify. <laughs> and I, I was uh, in deception. I thought I was so smart and, and basically nothing in the world will beat me until I met him and I realized I was just a dipstick. In, in the midst of this, we're right in the middle of the Israel issue right now in Godspeed Magazine. We just did an interview with Perry Stone and with a number of others that were Israel-specific um, for one reason or another. Um, what are your thoughts about God showing up in the Holy Land in terms of like where God shows himself as God is in action, as God's fingerprints are tangible in the way that Jesus showed up in your hospital? Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about Israel as God's fingerprints? God is always said, he said, I will bless who bless you and curse those who curse you. To Abraham. There is no way about it. I actually, I found out that I was a Jew on my mother's side and my dad's side from the tribe of Judah. You are kidding. No, 100%. And oh I, he gosh. told me when he was with me, he said, you know, you being a Jew, you'll understand what I'm talking about. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to discuss that later. I'll, I'll come back to it another time. I had more questions that I wanted to ask him. Amazing. Uh, Jesus told you yes, that you were Jewish. You know, you, you you being a Jew, he was talking to me in this. He said, you being a Jew, you understand. And you didn't know you were a I Jew at that know. point. Oh but my then I gosh. researched my lineage. And both my mom and my dad are Jewish. But if you look back to the history, the 12th tribe of Israel are formed in around the, 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 the Syria, what's called Syria now. So, and they were oppressed and forced into becoming Muslim, otherwise be killed. Right. So if you trace it back and you go, then you'll find out. Amazing. But you have to be centered. You have to be centered on the, on the word of God. Yes. Not your knowledge. Amen. So before going out there, go out, center yourself. I, I thought I was centered, uh, few months ago until I broke my leg on a horse riding accident. Then I had far too much time to spend with me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh love thy neighbor as thyself because God knows how much we love ourselves. <laughs> I had far too much time to spend with me and I realize I have so many areas where I still am having stronghold and holding on to mm -hmm. through trauma, through disappointment, through whatever it is. And I have to truly cleanse, in, uh, cleanse it out of me and say, okay, God, it's your will that I want in my life, not mine. Amen. I've tried it my way, it sucked. Yeah, me too, ditto. 
<laughs> so now I want to try it your way. And the nation of Israel are blessed through the blessing of uh, Abraham and every plan of God, everything God prophesied and told us through the prophet as came to fruition. So true. The, the only thing is now what we're supposed to do is to pray every day for their safety, for their blessing to come upon them, for their saving every unsaved soul to be uh, to become to the knowledge and the awareness yes, of the yes, knowledge of sal salvation, the message of salvation and act upon it. Yes. Because they are to be saved. They must be saved. Yes. The problem with the nation of Israel, they believe they are the nation of God and they are a wonderful, that's solid according to the Bible, according to the Old Testament. But it is coming to the knowledge of God through work, through the work of man. You, we can never do that. Mm -mm. And the Gentile and the Christian, we realize that we can only go, and the Messianic Jews as myself, we've realized that we can only go to the Father through Christ who strengthens us, who gives us salvation and redemption. Absolutely. Now what we have to pray, and that's what I'm praying for, is actually my mission next is I'm planning to go to Israel, equip the nation of Israel, the, 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 the government, everybody in, in places of authority, of how to deal with the Muslim influx and to open up their their eyes into the true agenda of Islam. Soft or strong, it doesn't matter what it is, but how the agenda, how it plays under the current. Haitham, thank you. Reverend Haitham Besmar, thank, thank you so you, much for joining us. It's well, thank you, it's an pleasure. honor. I wish you the blessing of the Lord to be upon you and may his face shine upon you in Ooh, Jesus' name. Ironic. Thank you so much and you as well, brother. For all of you, stay tuned for these commercial messages, because they're not commercials, they're really about you and God. So thank you for being with us. And if you bring the full gospel of Jesus Christ, Godspeed. I mean, you have an amazing platform, an amazing magazine. And Godspeed Mag looks like it's pretty awesome. Uh, Godspeed uh, magazine is a great way to get informed. You have an ear for the right store. He says something awesome about your magazine. And I can tell you, God's going to do something awesome with Godspeed magazine. And you get good content through Godspeed magazine. So it's a win-win. Uh, I'm calling the body of Christ to say we need to support Godspeed magazine. I bless you. And since you bring the gospel of Jesus, Godspeed. Amen. Woo, I like Godspeed. Yeah.